here to talk with Jack, without a doubt the most influential textile, textile designer in our lifetimes. Jack Larson grew up in Seattle along the misty coastline of the Puget Sound, a place infused with the sensibilities of Southeast Asia, the Northwest School, and a distinctly nonconformist viewpoint. While studying architecture at the University of Washington, he was introduced to weaving. His trajectory from that point is legendary, with showrooms across the nation, related travels to over 90 countries, and manufacturing sites in 30 separate countries. He's authored 10 publications and presides over one of the most gratifying botanical paradises, this side of Shangri-La, Longhouse Reserve. Please welcome Jack Lerner, Lerner Larson. Good afternoon. I don't have to thank you for coming in out of this beautiful day, because this place is still in the beautiful day. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite remarkable for a late afternoon. <clears throat> We're not doing a lecture today, but a dialogue. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, want you to share as much as we can uh, what, 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 what we care about at Longhouse. A longhouse is not just a fancy garden. Uh, it's a teaching tool. Uh, my feeling is that even with the remarkable film we have today and the colored photography, we still learn best in three dimensions. And uh, <coughs> it's not just about plants or about beauty. <coughs> it's about finding a more personal lifestyle. And I feel that's the biggest challenge I have, is to encourage that. Uh, both government and industry would like to be as predictable and as sheep-like as possible. <laughs> they could count on our votes and our sales. Uh, and. Uh, I don't believe in that. I, I believe everyone should be a, a resistant to mass culture and in any way possible be, be personal and to have their children grow up to be individuals and not part of a crowd. Um, the uh, Longhouse has more and more activities, it seems. Last week, uh, we had, we have 2,000 school children to come to Longhouse during the year, and uh, they uh, are asked to do something to express their experience there in any media. And with art teachers out here, it's phenomenal. I, art was my favorite subject, but we mostly just painted. Uh, but here we have first grade cinematographers, and we have uh, in middle school there's product design, and, uh, high school architecture, and it's just it's quite amazing. In New York City, where I also live, uh, the art is usually not taught in school anymore. It's uh, I don't know why. It's taught at Longhouse. Well, <laughs> Why there's such emphasis on, on math and uh, science. I had an A in algebra and I remembered absolutely nothing. <laughs> the, uh, nothing. Uh, but I think uh, to focus on, uh, on, on intelligence, how to, we practice every kind of sport, but uh, we don't practice intelligence. Uh, and we learn facts and figures and history and cities and uh, all sorts of stuff we may or may not remember, but it's not very important. Um, you can get that kind of information on your phone very readily. It's, but to, to be responsive, to face up to opportunities as well as problems, and to uh, uh, our head gardener, has a remarkable intelligence. He understands systems, whether it's a plant 
or a car or uh, anything in the house. Uh, and once he knows the system, he knows how to repair it. And uh, that is uh, intelligence. And most of us only have intellect. Um, well, that's uh, a good point. Yeah, you, and, uh, that's such a good point. And you have been a nonconformist throughout your career. I didn't have much choice. Oh, why is that? <laughs> I wasn't good at conforming. <laughs> We had a, uh, at our student benefit, uh, we had all these people uh, that a lot of them had skills like dancing and so forth. And uh, uh, I remembered when I was at school, uh, in order to be really successful, you were either an athlete or a musician. And I wasn't either. But at Longhouse, I would have done better. Uh -huh. um, that uh, so there's a place for everyone. One of the things I like about Longhouse is that we're multiracial, and uh, that's quite important. We have a lot of of immigrants in this neighborhood, and uh, they're doing well, so much better than they would in the city. Um, and we we do everything we can to uh, encourage. Uh, multi-racism. Uh, the last year, the uh, best of show was a Chinese girl who was extremely talented. A theatrical costume on a high school level that was thoroughly professional. And then we found that she'd been born in Ch Shanghai and thrown in a wastebasket. Oh. And but uh, fortunately, she found some very responsible uh, parents, and uh, her life was fine. But that's pretty shocking. Um, I'm going to ask you to be part of the dialogue, and it's a small enough group. I think we can hear you if you speak up, and we don't want to hear you talk. We want you to ask you to ask questions, <laughs> and I'll try to answer. So. Go well, ahead. well, I have a question. All right, good. <laughs> I am uh, astonished. Well, actually, as I was preparing to talk with you, I, I, the first time in all these times I've interviewed people, I thought, I don't know where to start. This mm. man is just, you've designed the world. You designed the world. I am a world citizen. <laughs> uh, I've worked in 60 countries. And that's pretty extraordinary, because working with people in all those places is so much better than just being a tourist and floating along the top, uh, usually the top, and not very deep into a local culture. Um, and uh, I'm a lucky designer, because uh, I pretty much own my company, and most designers are told, by the sales manager who runs things, let's make last year's bestseller or someone else's bestseller. And I can say, no, we're going to do something I've never done before. Because what I like to do best is what I don't know how to do yet. And that's a great deal of fun. Well, you've, you've made an entire lifestyle out of doing what you didn't know how to do and and really creating this sort of utopian platform. I, I, I recommend it. <laughs> I also recommend to young people to forget about a job. Uh, one of us have to have a day job to get started. I, I, uh, I gardened as, a, as for income when I was in school. But uh, that what we need to find is our career, our calling, our vocation, something we absolutely love to do and want to do it as much as we can, as long as we can. And usually that leads to doing it well. And in any case, we've done what we want to do. And uh, well, the happiest men I have met have decided, you know, often in their 30s, that, that whatever they uh, studied in college and 
are now a bookkeeper or something or other. It's not what they want to do. And they have to park the children with grandma and go back to school, but they feel that they've been born again because they're now doing what they want to do. So you discovered what you wanted to do while in school for architecture, and you discovered weaving, and you really never looked back. My best friend was a paragon from six years old through college. He was always our president. He was the apple of his parents' eye. He was the darling of all the girls. Uh, he was captain of the football and leader of the band. Uh, he was absolutely phenomenal. And I was his friend. And I decided, I, want, I can't do what he did, but uh, I want to find something I can do well and succeed at. And I did. <laughs> So you discovered weaving because your friend, uh, I can't think of his name, his father was an ambassador, a Chinese ambassador, and he was studying um, pre-Columbian textiles, and you oh. encountered them. Oh. That was part of it. In uh, interior architecture, there were two girls that were spectacular. They could draw like an angel, and they were miles ahead of me. And uh, I did moderately well, but not like they did. On the other hand, in weaving, uh, there were some old, older uh, teachers, and they didn't have a boy in their class very often, and they were enormously encouraging. So uh, I uh, went along with that, and eventually I decided I won't be an architect. I will be a designer for architects. My parents were crushed. They assumed I would mm -hmm. always be poor. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they liked my houses here. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we got on very well. So you got the first ever BFA in weaving at the University of Washington, correct? Yeah. You created your own uh, milieu. I was, I was also lucky. I had a great teacher in textiles who wrote the, the great, translated the great book on pre-Columbian weaving. And I was in part of, I got credit for helping her with diagrams for these complex uh, Peruvian weavings. And, and also learned something about bookmaking. Uh, I'm working on my 11th book now. Uh, it uh, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> What's it about? What? What's your new book about? What's your new book about? You say you're working on it. It's book. a smaller book on Longhouse, but it's why. Uh, not what it is, but uh, why did we do it? And often it was to save money, not to spend money. Yeah. And, uh, and things that other people could use the same logic, uh, the uh, problem solving, uh, in other ways to, to do things differently than they than they were brought up to do. Well, you have said in your writings that you entered the, the world of modernist architecture and what you wanted to insert was an element of luxury. Is that, is that fair to oh. say? That there was no appreciation of maybe comfort or... As testimony to do what your heart tells you to do and forget about the mind. The mind can lead you astray. We can rationalize anything. What we should do, what we might be able to, could do, uh, but we want to do. That is the magic. And when I, I, I took a master's so I could teach in the university, I got to like that. And uh, my instructor at Cranbrook uh, designed for Noel and for Sarnan and so forth. I said, well, maybe being a professional design, weaving designer uh, would be the more interesting. And then we went to New York on a week's field trip, and I had lived in San Francisco, Los Angeles. I knew Chicago. This was the first place I ever felt at home. In 1950, New York was, was half the people living there then were European. And it seemed like it was Bermuda, 
happening uh, there. And everything about it, and with no reason at all, with no job, I moved to New York with my loom and yarns. And, and uh, I was given an apartment because I would help on Lieber House, and, and, uh, which was the first high rise. And um, uh, you know, I was such a good steer. Um, there were 125 weavers and uh, editors in New York looking for new talent. <laughs> and I was easy, pretty easy to find. The Museum of Modern Art uh, showed my work. And it, the first year I was there, they didn't care that I had no reputation or size or stability, uh, pedigree. Uh, it was, it was absolutely remarkable. So uh, at, at Lever House, you, that was your first big commission, correct? Yes. And in those curtains, you actually inserted silver filament, correct? And that, that had to have never have been done. Yeah. These, uh, Lever House, as you know, has a, the lobby floor is all glass. And they wanted fabric, not as curtains, a sort of sculpture uh, in the middle of, the, of that room. And uh, as I had been at Cranberg, uh, they assumed maybe I'd have some talent and could do that. <laughs> and uh, it did help. Uh, so what did, what, what did Cranberg do? You've referred to it as Hollywood for weavers and craftspeople. And you've talked about Annie Albers and the other people that you studied with. Can you tell us a little bit how it prepared you for New York? The, uh, well, as, as an example, our whole culture today is on much. How many billions? How many stories? How many uh, everything? That we assume, uh, they ask us to assume that more is more. And it seldom is. Uh, and great ideas don't usually start in the largest places. The, the most important school, probably, uh, pre-war America, was Black Mountain, uh, with European teachers. Most of them came out after Hitler, came over after Hitler, and uh, with brand new ideas about creativity. And not just the style of modernism, but the thinking of it, that John Cage and people like that came out of Black Mountain. Uh, half the audience, the artists in uh, the Hamptons were also from that. Many of them were, were New Yorkers who went to Black Mountain. At, uh, Cranbrook was quite different. It was uh, set up by a very wealthy man with uh, Sarnen doing the architecture and uh, and the thought was that we creative people were going to have a hard life. And for two years, maybe we should have a little ivory tower. <laughs> and uh, it just stopped shining our shoes. You know, <laughs> but uh, but it, was, it was a hotbed. There were 65 students when I was there. There were fewer uh, when Noel and Sarnen and Eames and Victoria, uh, that whole generation, uh, were at Cranbrook. Uh, and that did make it easier for me. In New York, they didn't know that I was another generation. It may not be Charles Eaton, but they, they did give me a, a break. So, so this was the trajectory from a, the Bauhaus. It, 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 it came from that the was core. also another small school mm -hmm. that changed the world. Yes, absolutely. But Cranbrook was sort of a descendant of the Bauhaus, yes. wasn't it? It, it was Finnish, uh, and it was Sarnen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was a cute story. There were cousins of, of Hearst who controlled the communications in the Midwest and were, had wealth. And when they were 26, they married and built a 102-room house with a moat around it and on 600 acres. And having done that, their next thing, well, now what do we do? They thought, well, maybe we should build a model uh, farm. We have, and they got Sarnen uh, over to design it. And then they said, oh, that's too good for animals. What else <laughs> do we do? And uh, they made it into a boys' school. Uh, 
the best, the most prestigious prep school in the Midwest. And, um, but they brought over great talents like Carl Millis and, and so forth to work on the project. And then America said, well, we'd like to come to st and study with those, those great talents. And that's how the art school started. Well, you have a great story, and since this is an educational facility, it's, it's a good thing for us to, to note. You said that as a student on scholarship, your advisor or your primary teacher at one point at Cranbrook said, you're not working hard enough. And you couldn't believe. You were working so hard, and you couldn't believe that she would say that. And the, uh, the, uh, yes, uh, we, the, the rule of the Weave Studio is that we couldn't be there after 11.30 or before 7 in the morning. And we read that backwards. So <laughs> we were there from 7.30 to 11. And, uh, I, I also learned to, to work quickly. And typically in college, you have a quarter or a semester for a project. Uh, and uh, design is not like that. Um, in architecture, we had, we had uh, classes given at noon one day, and we had to have the solution and drawings of it the next day. That's, that's real. But uh, having all this time, the dolly, and uh, anyway, at Cranbrook, I learned to work quickly and uh, to plan a, one project ahead while I was weaving the, the, the days. Uh, and that was very important because uh, coming to New York, I needed all, all, of, all of that. Isn't that fascinating? When I read that in your book, I thought, how dare she? And then to see the impact that that one comment had on you is fascinating. I mean, you look tired just thinking about it. <laughs> So at age 25, correct me if I'm wrong, you became Jack Leonard Larson Incorporated, right? Well, I won't, we weren't much uh, later than that. We thought we'd done America, and we started Larson Europe. Um, and uh, that was a challenge. Um, I'm not great at languages, but uh, uh, we learned so much. There were such great weaving families in, in every country in Europe to work with and do things I'd never done before. The, uh, that was one. A, a sad story. We were working then with the second largest textile mill and mills in the world. And we were doing sheets and towels for them. And when we were starting in Zurich, I said, how are you guys doing in Europe? They said, oh, we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> we don't know. We think their beds are different sizes. And we don't know that they bathe so often. <laughs> that bit company is deservedly out of business. Mm. Uh, but American uh, textiles, in particular, were just that stupid. Uh, mm. And uh, they covered up for each other, the executives. They had very posh lives. Uh, and they failed. And that's... And with it, a lot of jobs failed. Um, well, Larson Fabrics revolutionized uh, bath towels and carpeting. I mean, what did you say? That nobody understood they could weave on both sides? That if you did well, one thing to one I side? I worked on towels for several large companies. And uh, terry weaving is absolutely extraordinary. It's very simple. Uh, but how uh, you get the pile on both sides, and uh, it's mostly done by graphic designers, didn't know that it could be different on both sides, and you could mix things up and make tweeds, and, and it was all kinds of things. And then when we started with pile carpets, uh, the same ideas came through, that we could do things that had not been done before. Uh, and that was fun, uh, to, to innovate. Well, you also made neckties that hadn't been done before, and in a, in a, you know, it seems to me um, that post World War II there were there was a, a wave of, 
uh, nonconformity in the United States. So, yeah. so people were thrilled to have these woven neckties well, in the 1950s. Just, just people. One of my favorite professors said, when you get to New York, don't wear the kind of clothes you wear here. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, you wear ties in New York. And mm -hmm. uh, my ties from packing were a little rumpled, so I was wearing one of my hand-woven ties. Uh, and I was in a smart shop. They said, where did you get that tie? I said, I made it. Said, How many can you make before Christmas? <laughs> and, uh, and they wanted 1,000. We did 750. But I got a lot of the day job for a lot of those Black Mountain students was making my ties. <laughs> and what was great about it, the people I had <coughs> admired the most didn't like to wear ties. But this is Louis Kahn and, and Calder and Ian Pei and uh, uh, all, all, all those good people uh, mm -hmm. wore my fuzzy ties. <laughs> I love that story. Do you have any of those? A few. Oh, good. <laughs> And you did the textiles for Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, which is probably uh, this. Well, we did. We, excuse me, we, we did. Uh, most, they liked, they'd always liked, before me, uh, when it was built, uh, tribal textiles, uh, rugs and pillows and uh, things, uh, ethnographic. And mine sort of, I, we did a lot of hand spun hand-woven fabrics in Morocco and, and Colombia and Mexico. Uh, and uh, so my friend Edgar Kaufman Jr. Uh, kept buying them for falling water. There was a cute story on that. When I finally got there, I just built roundhouse and I put in uh, stone floors. And I wanted to be so sure that I never got liquid wax on it that I would get down and I bought a polisher or I would put a little wax on myself. And when I got to Falling Water, they had the most beautiful stone floors I had ever seen. And I found the housekeeper and what was their secret? He said, well, you know, Mr. Larson, that, uh, that Mr. Uh, Wright worked for the Johnson Wax people. <laughs> and he said, we couldn't use anything but local. <laughs> So after that, we used to with So Frank Lloyd Wright was a little irascible, yes? Mr. Wright was sort of irascible. He was wonderful. <laughs> uh, and then he became a friend. He had one, for a while, he was living at the plaza and my uh, showroom, where I was also sleeping in the back, uh, was just a block or two away. And he would drop in for a chat. Um, but uh, he was he was not provident. Um, he never could manage to pay taxes and would get into real trouble. And at one point, there was a black tie benefit at the plaza uh, to pay his taxes. Oh my God! And uh, wow. he also also to help financially, he'd done a perfectly rotten line of furniture, or you, they left it him use his name on it, and also textiles that were uh, not very good. Uh, and uh, we designers were crushed that our idol had uh, fallen so low. And so he got a, and he was a short man, but he, a giant. Uh, he had more stage presence than anyone I've never met except Paul Rosen. Mm -hmm. uh, he just, Fill the stage. Anyway, he uh, tells a couple of uh, knowing stories. And then he said, have any of you ever tried to s swim uphill? I have all my life. Ah. And now it seems recently I've come downhill so fast and so far that tonight I can talk to you eye to eye. Oh my god, what a great statement. He was amazing. <laughs>
Did he understand luxury in the same way you under? Did he understand luxury in the same way you did? Did you see eye to eye on that? Yes. Well, things that were sensuous. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was a great collector of mm -hmm. Oriental art. He has lived in Japan. And he, uh, but my first big order uh, was for Taliesin uh, East, uh, the music room, 200 yards in my first year. And uh, that, was, that was a very good sale financially. It was also a compliment. Um, so that's why we got on so well. <laughs> you know, one of the things that r repeats in your autobiography and in talking with you is how intimate you've been with so many friends that have come along with you and influenced you and worked with you and in fact the um, architect who did Longhouse was your 30th project with him. Can, can you talk about your this uh, world around you well, that you've created? Well not having to do what the sales manager said. My other great treat was that I did design for the greatest architects of our time, about all of them except Corbusier. And I was so impressed with what they were doing, and I tried to get in their heads and to think, what are they wanting out of this commission? These would be opera houses or usually public buildings. Um, uh, airlines, we did a lot together. Um, and uh, it would pull me out of any ruts to, and that, that uh, not my style, but what would they want that I had never done before? And with that, I kept doing newer and newer things, and that was that was the way to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm I a little unhappy now with two things. Um, one is there's such a boom on mid-century design, and all my friends who were designing furniture in the 50s. Uh, uh, are venerated, and they're, they're stuff that they made still exists. The fabrics wear out. Uh, I don't have that uh, mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. And I was an early bloomer, and uh, I'm not sure if that's the best. Uh, but, uh, but I've had a very good, long life, but I've never been happier than now. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really swell, and it's a great place to spend it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a lot right there. Mm. So you started traveling in the late 50s, early 1960s, even for the U.S. State Department to Taiwan and Vietnam? Yeah. My first agent was in Miami, and she went to Haiti and found out that they were making a wick for the tin can oil lamps uh, with native cotton, and said, and someone told them, you're making yarn, and if you have yarn, you can weave, and we got a loom for them, and couldn't I go down and help them? And I got DuPont to help with the dyeing, and uh, that was my first uh, venture uh, overseas, and it was wonderfully successful. And I realized that hand-spun yarn has so much character that uh, the great loss of the Industrial Revolution was not the power loom versus the hand loom. It's, it's power spinning versus hand spinning. Anyway, and if, if one has this wonderful yarn, usually the von Dyne was a little buried, uh, one doesn't need much else. And then um, Morocco. And uh, the Moroccan fabrics reminded um, Breuer uh, of fabrics he had used in Europe, mm. and, uh, and he, he wanted those. And then Skidmore and the other architectural firms tended to do what Breuer did, and it became a sizable business. He did hand spuns in many countries. So you, you went to West Africa, you were in Afghanistan, you were all over Southeast Asia, you spent a lot of time in Japan almost always working with local artisans and learning their craft and that 
Is it fair to say that that was translated into your, uh, into Larson Fabrics? Yeah, yeah. I always, and that helps. Um, to just a design without having a market uh, doesn't get you very far. And uh, fortunately, we had a, a spectacular system for distribu distribution. We had agents in 36 cities worldwide. Uh, so uh, that, that really helped. We had a market for what I was designing. Yeah. It, is it true that you taught Louis Kahn to weave? Well, not on purpose. He was <laughs> the most charming of the architects we worked with. But um, on his uh, Unitarian Church in Rochester, um, he had built this typical concrete box with light at the top and uh, chairs that had no sound absorption. And the sound was horrific. And uh, that's often the case. But we did wall hangings on three sides. It also provided visual interest. That looking at bare concrete walls with no windows wasn't very interesting. Uh, and we solved the problem slowly. Um, but uh, Louis didn't understand what we were trying to do. And, and he would come over to New York and uh, get a little weaving lesson so he could understand what we were, what we were making. A remarkable and amusing man. He could also lecture for three hours, just like uh, Buckminster Fuller, without you knowing, uh, understanding a thing he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so one of the things that not everybody realizes about Jack is that before Longhouse Reserve, there was Roundhouse. And so in the midst of this global empire and traveling in these very high-end circles with New Yorkers and all over Europe and, and Asia, suddenly you bought acreage in the Northwest Woods in East Hampton in probably, I know it opened in 1966. I'm not sure when you purchased the property. And, and proceeded to hack down weeds. I mean, is that fair to say? Well, Roundhouse, uh, which was my African compound next door to Longhouse, was beautiful land, as it was. There were meadows and rolling, and it had 100 foot hedges around it from when it was a farm, and uh, wonderful pines and cedars, and it didn't do, do anything. But I bought Longhouse property for protection next door uh, that was <coughs> flat and dull and full of thousands of ungainly trees and monster vines. And uh, it's only was affordable <coughs> next door. So when I decided uh, to build uh, Longhouse as a teaching tool, uh, as a case study, uh, it was the most logical thing to do was just to move next door, so we did. But everything that's good about it is pretty much man-made. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Alfonso Osorio was my gardening partner, and he said one day, he said, and Jack, you know, you'll find that each year the trees become more noble. <laughs> and they have. Oh, and that's a great incredible. statement. <laughs> we have a great horticulture that helps with the, some of the trees, but a lot of them just do it on their own. It's a gift to us that they become so enormous and so beautiful without our doing anything about it. Well, as I've, excuse me, as I've looked at your, chiefly your textiles over the last few weeks, I, I think of you as a painter. You, your progression and your aesthetics are so painterly. And when I think about you at Longhouse uh, co creating composition out of uh, 16 acres of m not much, you know, w weeds and well, I, brambles. I've had 40 years. Well, you've had some time, yeah. yeah. 
But it yeah. seems to me that I think a few years ago you and I talked and you said you looked at aerial photographs that the, that the township provided for mapping or whatever, and that helped you to conceive of this massive property and kind of shape it. Right. I, the, when I first did that, there was Roundhouse. Well, the, uh, the, it was so gray. Uh, it was a winter picture. Uh, no leaves on our oak trees, and what's now Longhouse looked like the desert, and Roundhouse with all those evergreen trees looked like the oasis. Uh, <laughs> we sort of evened it out. Right. Yeah. But so when you started working on Longhouse, were you living in Roundhouse? Oh, of course. And then it, it went on forever, and uh, uh, that it was five years. Uh, to build the longhouse, and uh, the Times had three three pages when it was new, and uh, the editorial the headline was the house that Jack built and <laughs> built. And <laughs> <laughs> so I. I, this is a little off topic, but obviously you engaged in a lot of gardening uh, when you came out to East Hampton, and there is this sort of wabi-sabi Japanese aesthetic involved in gardening that might be very similar to the, the process you engaged in in weaving, that it's a Gardening is a state of impermanence uh, that you have to accept the so transient nature all of it. Using your hands and being aware of textures and colors and so forth. Mm -hmm. My the reason I became a gardener was when I was about two and a half. I was given a package of radish seed and taught how to to grow them, and in about three weeks. I had a some crop, <laughs> and, and my first compliment. Um, and uh, I said, well, that's, well, let's repeat that. I, well, I started collecting wild trees for baby wheel wild trees to make my own garden at four, and uh, I pretty much gardened. Then I read Andre Gide, and if you remember, he was always working on the roses, and he wrote 22 books. And I couldn't understand how you could do both. Uh, uh, but I have learned to do both. And partly because uh, the reason I garden here is I can get away from the studio without having to face up to leisure. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to be idle, so I'm not. <laughs> So your longhouse, the building, was was uh, inspired by a, a Shinto shrine. The Shinto the shrine. The Shinto this shrine. Is, uh, where the emperor is uh, crowned as, as, as son of heaven. Um, and they rebuild the building every 20 years. It's so complex, it has no fasteners. It's all uh, very complex. Uh, joints to hold this, these massive timber together, and uh, on alternate sites they they build it. And my favorite building, and I happened to get back the book on Issei when I decided to build, and it seemed propitious. And uh, we tried with the Japanese to do it of wood and more like the original, but uh, it's, it's masonry. But it is up on stilts, which is a great idea for here who don't have the old, and we, for view and getting uh, breezes. It has massive roofs, like 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 uh, Issei Shrine. And that's about all it has in common. But uh, I didn't really appreciate Arosana's uh, buildings at, at Granbrook when I was there, because they were so subtle. They weren't, um, he, he didn't break rules. Uh, he, uh, it wasn't uh, in your face modernism. Uh, later I learned how masterful it was. And uh, Longhouse is a modern house. It's not a box, it's not white, it's not conformist, uh, but I appreciate the architect's refinement 
more and more each year, how well it's done, how the, the floors are tiled, the walls are textured cement, uh, and uh, it's, it's, low, it's all low maintenance, very easy to look after. It also, there's an aspect to it that feels like it's the hull of a ship and you're up at the top. And I know you have quite a view from up there. I'm not sure how much you can see, but um, I would just have one more question, then we're going to open it up to the audience. But mm. when, did, um, when did you start? I know you're, a, you're a, a very ambitious collector, and you have a fantastic collection of many things. But when did a sculpture become a part of Longhouse? Sculpture? Mm -hmm. uh, I had some at the for at Roundhouse, um, but well, first of all, I think the sculptor uh, loves to be outdoors, uh, to have uh, the natural light, and the strong shade and shadow, and the, then the changes in the light from morning to evening and from summer to winter, uh, and. Uh, contrast between the hard form and the softness of natural forms. Uh, uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, so, and uh, knowing that, it also seemed reasonable that artists and galleries would rather have their work at Long House than very expensive uh, art storage. Uh, the way sculpture is stored, is stored a buyer couldn't see it. I, so uh, jam back, and uh, so that that also has helped us. Most of our sculptures borrowed, mm -hmm. uh, and some of us begged. But uh, <laughs> next year we're going to be 25 years old, and it's going to be wonderful. Oh my goodness! I bet that party's uh, underway we are already. We're really going to try harder than we've ever done to be absolutely wonderful, and so come see it. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, <laughs> Thank you, Jack. You're miraculous. So, um, I'd like to uh, invite you to ask it's questions. That the sculpture <clears throat> has a sculptor ever offered you work that you didn't want? Of course. Often. <laughs> 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 How do you handle that? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> no, we we avoid we avoid that. <laughs> we also a lot of our work is uh, is. Uh, Humanoid uh, is figurative, and uh, uh, I keep telling my friends at Storm King and places like that they might try it. In Europe, you see figurative bronzes, but there aren't the sculptures artists here I tend to avoid them, and we don't. Mm -hmm. Ever the nonconformist. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, over here. How do you execute your design? You make a design, and then you have to select somebody to make a thousand yards of it. And I'm a weaver, and uh, uh, we would get the, the yards that it would be made of from wherever that was, and uh, we would weave hand samples of it, sure. and then send it for for them to to, to copy them. And I'm, I don't draw well. And so I've always had people around who do, who can, can draw what, uh, what I'm wanting. I mean, you have to really know the quality of these people you're turning it over to, also. Yeah. Well, we learned as we, we, as we went on, we knew more and more how to yeah. solve the problem. A lot of it would come to me at night in my sleep. Yeah. It was Jack who told Dale Chihuly he should take up glass blowing, right? <laughs> because oh, what was he trying to do? My favorite hobby is seeing a C and creating an O. Mm -hmm. Things that should happen and getting them to happen. But uh, <laughs> one of my and I connected a lot of <coughs> ideas and people, people and ideas. But. Uh, Dale has been my prime example. Uh, he w left interior architecture also in his senior year to weave, and he was trying to weave rods of glass. And uh, 
They weren't great. <laughs> and I said, but if you're interested in blast, go work with Harvey Littleton at Madison, who the father of American Glass. And he was Harvey's best student. And uh, so pretty soon uh, he won a prize of $2,000 and was going to start a glass school in rainy Seattle for people in tents. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, my warehouser friends have been wanting to do something like that. Why don't we work together? And uh, they had thousands of acres of timberland. And uh, they gave some for Pilchuck and, and $17 million to get it started. It's the best class nice school gift, in, huh? in the world. Uh, and that, that's fun to do. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> yes. You had a question? What brought you to East Hampton initially? And, oh. and prior to purchasing the land for Roundhouse, had you owned land no. prior to yeah. But that was a good story and a lucky one. One of my first clients in, the, in my first year in New York was Bertha Schaefer, who was both an interior architect and owned a very important gallery. And uh, she and I, my first New York summer, I was in the top floor with skylights that I'd never known heat before. <laughs> yeah. And she invited me to her house on the beach in Amagansett, and she was an insider to all the artist parties. And uh, so I was her companion for a number of years, and I got to know the art scene here uh, that, in that way. Uh, and uh, finally, I rented a chauffeur's apartment. Uh, with a, it even had a guest room near Artist Beach on, on Lily Pond Lane. Um, and came with breakfast. Um, and. <laughs> I had two bicycles, and uh, uh, that was my advent in, in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, most, I believe most design today is done by computer. Have you ever used a computer for textile design? I'm, I'm, I'm pre-illiterate at computer design. <laughs> and it's certainly handy. But I found with students, uh, so many of them have learned on a computer, they thought that's all the world could do. Mm. If it couldn't be done on a computer, it couldn't be done. <laughs> that I found a little difficult. And not learning skills uh, prior to that. But it's remarkable. <clears throat> yes, there's a... Um, speak I'm up. I'm interested if there was an emotional... Come forward so I can hear you. I, I think she's asking if, if it, you struggled with uh, being a, a nonconformist, if you had regrets that it, that it was dangerous to go forward uh, in uh, nonconformity. Oh, uh, I was rather successful socially uh, in high school. I was salutatorian, and uh, ran the business manager for the school paper. Uh, but, uh, in art school, uh, after that, I discovered bohemia and not having to conform. And was that ever wonderful? Uh, one didn't have to please the crowd. Uh, there were other crowds that might tolerate the way you were. And uh, I, I've never much changed. <laughs> I've never tried to fit in, because I don't. Thank you. Yes. You, you've traveled so Speak much. Up. You've traveled so much over the world. And I was wondering in your life, what profound cultural experiences that you reflect back on that had an effect on you. Uh, other people's way of doing things, like the Japanese house that has no specific rooms for sleeping or eating or living or whatever, uh, things like that make you think, is, is, which is right. And uh, so I am I'm, uh, pretty unspecific. Um, the, uh, I find travel wonderful, but uh, to, uh, to go as a worker, it's certainly the way I like to go. 
I sometimes visit. I'm just in Paris, which was wonderful mm -hmm. as, as a visitor. But I'd much rather work in a place and rub shoulders with real people. Anyone else? Yeah. On everything you've done, what are you most proud of? Uh, growing up. <laughs> uh, I, of course, was warped to be a prodigy. Uh, I put all of my energy and focus into what I was doing, and uh, and at uh, 34 we played a paid our first dividend, <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought, well, if I'm so good at working, I can do some other things, and I have 11 years of intensive analysis. Uh, <laughs> I. I, I, I I learned to grow up. And I realized if I decided at 19 I was going to focus all of my energy into doing and not into people, uh, I, 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 that, that was pretty silly that I wasn't the mentality then of even a 19 year old. That's what a 14 year old might have thought. So I finally grew up and uh, more rounded. Than, uh, than I had been, and grateful for it. You know, I think in in reading about you and learning more about you, I've my big overall question is, how did you cast this net across the whole globe? Slow, but I slowly. <laughs> I had fifty years. <laughs> but I think that a lot of it is you really are a people person. You really cultivate rich relationships with the people you work with, and 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 that's part of your net that is cast across the planet. It's when I was about four, I started a gang uh, of other <laughs> little kids that would go along with me to build something or to go someplace. And it's pretty much been that way all of my life. <laughs> that, uh, uh, they weren't, uh, they were people that were happy to uh, ha go along as a group of seemingly going in the right direction. Uh, and uh, it, it's worked over and over again for me. <laughs> I think the fact that people realized I was desperate to do, to make things happen. They were, uh, they were willing to invite me to go to Vietnam and Thailand and all those places. And, and I was happy to do something I'd never done before. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> well, Jack, it's an incredible pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much.